Um, my name's Howard Love, and I'm uh, a consultant, I guess, with Mustard 21. Uh, first off, the, uh, I have to make it clear that all of the mustard that you're seeing here are the products from Agriculture Canada Saskatoon and uh, uh, Dr. Bifeng Chen. Uh, she is the uh, breeder of all of the material, so I don't want to I don't want uh, anybody to get the impression that Mustard 21 is doing the, the breeding. It is Agriculture Canada, germplasm and uh, breeding. Uh, M21 or Mustard 21 is a, a collaborative partner. And uh, we actually came in to uh, fill the void when the co-op system collapsed uh, with, uh, with uh, canola uh, co taking over uh, with private companies. There was not the funding for the, the uh, co-op testing system and the multi-location uh, testing uh, available. And so uh, M21 was formed and SAS Mustard uh, Association and the Canadian Mustard Association, basically a uh, membership uh, puts in the, their, um, uh, I think it's a checkoff uh, type system. And so that's seed money and then that money is then put forward to the government with proposals to say, okay, we need, we need to do these basic uh, testing uh, uh, protocols and, and we've got some projects and we, we uh, facilitate that process, multiply up the money and then uh, basically serve as a handoff uh, organization to the seed industry, but we make sure that there's enough seed to start that process. And uh, as you uh, uh, move forward, I mean, it's gonna be more and more important that, that uh, there's seed available to, uh, to jumpstart into the variety development. So M21, our mandates are to increase yield. Uh, we also need to make sure that Canada maintains a consistent supply of mustard into the world market and it's got to be uh, quality. Quality is number one. Uh, mustard is being sold into Europe and they're of course uh, uh, paranoid about GMOs. We've got to stay clean of, of uh, contamination with, uh, with our, with our uh, major canola crop. So that's, that's a challenge. And uh, another challenge is uh, maintaining the supply and that's a challenge because other crops have been increasing yield. I mean, um, the canola story, what's, what's happened with the canola story? Uh, right now, um, the data out of Saskatchewan, brown soil zone, the yield of canola would be double what, uh, what the uh, yellow mustard here is. And so we need to uh, increase the yield of, of the mustard to, be, to maintain competitive, competitiveness. I mean, right now the mustard is surprisingly uh, profitable uh, simply because the price is, is quite, quite interesting. And uh, it does have uh, some pretty good uh, drought tolerance compared to uh, uh, canola, but the hybrid uh, in canola has really uh, helped that, uh, that uh, uh, drought tolerance. And as a result, the acres of canola have moved further south in Saskatchewan and, and uh, into other drier areas because your hybrids have a better, better volume, uh, that root mass gets, gets going into the soil deeper and exploring uh, the uh, nutrients. So um, what we're looking at here with this trial are uh, lines that are uh, uh, sort of one to two years out from going into the uh, co-op trials. And uh, what we are trying to do is in, in yellow mustard, basically uh, it is uh, what they call an outcrossing species. So these are their populations. And so if you apply the hybrid concepts, it's quite uh, a challenge. And you actually have to select uh, uh, plants that don't uh, uh, suffer when you, when you try and uh, inbreed them. And uh, actually, Agriculture Canada has been successful in, in some populations in pulling out material that don't uh, 
that don't uh, suffer from inbreeding depression. And inbreeding depression will cause your plants after two or three generations, you'll, you'll basically get very tiny, tiny, tiny plants. If you try and, and um, uh, sort of bud pollinate one plant on itself, in this species, in general, it suffers from severe inbreeding depression. So it, it's, that's a limiting factor to, uh, to developing uh, the, the uh, inbreds for uh, the hybrid production. And the other thing is uh, in canolas, they, they use uh, technology like um, um, uh, doubled haploids where they take the, uh, take the pollen uh, out, of, out of the developing buds and they plate them and grow them on, on uh, cultures, uh, agar cultures, and double them up and you get a purely inbred plant. Well, if you try to do that with this species, you don't, uh, aren't successful because of the inbreeding depression as well. So it's a gradual process. So some of this material uh, is uh, um, um, partially inbred and uh, we're sort of on our way to exploiting the heterosis that we see in hybrids. And uh, you may see that uh, some of them are, are more vigorous than others. Unfortunately, we've had uh, uh, an issue with the, um, the timing of the seed this year. We got caught in a uh, uh, public sector strike in Chile when we were sending our seed down and uh, we couldn't get clearance. And as a result, there was a cascade effect into this year. So hopefully, uh, Ken, we can clean that up for the future and get the seed in a more timely fas fashion here. But it was probably seeded, I think, about two weeks uh, later up. Does any, uh, Mike, do you know when, when the trial beside us was seeded, the canola? I, I think the canola beside was about the 5th or 6th of May, and this was probably about the 17th. Or yeah, so, so in your mind, try not to compare the two. Uh, because they're not, they're not actually seeded the same date, so it's not quite a fair comparison. <clears throat> Although they, we do have some volunteers, and I'm not sure when they, when they might have come up. So, um, so this is the yellow mustard. This is the um, major condiment uh, um, mustard on the prairies. Um, and uh, I'm not sure this year what the percentage was, but I think it's probably the dominant, uh, it's over 50% of the acres would be, would be the condiment. It does, it does uh, fluctuate from year to year. But this is, this is generally considered the, uh, uh, the staple. And this is the, the um, now which one is it? Is it the, the prepared yellow? Uh, I think the, the standard French sort of thing is, is this one. I, th I think that's right. Yeah. So, um, uh, we can just we can just walk through this, and then we'll uh, we'll head over and uh, uh, look at some of the other species as we as we go around. So, as as um, um, you can just walk along and see, there's there's quite a bit of difference. The border here would be the standard variety, um, and Dante is the standard variety here. And I think we've got, uh, I was taking notes here earlier. Yeah, and Dante's the check here as well. And you can actually see, I'll, I'll uh, point out and Dante as well in the trial here for you. So you can see some of them are, are quite, uh, quite a bit uh, larger and, and also the uniformity is quite good in some of them. So it's actually a good, a good time to see the flower mass right now on some of the earlier varieties. It's really... So what do you consider to be a good yield? Uh, I think the average yield is, uh, I think it's 16 bushels right now. 16 bushels to the acre under dry land in southern Saskatchewan. That's the average. That's the average. So, so I mean, a good yield would be double that, right? I mean... So I think I think canola canola um, under the same conditions would be 33 I think on average in in that zone. So I think we're getting uh, some of this compaction effect. So this compaction is from uh, uh, Ken 
Ken feels it's uh, from two years ago, there was, uh, the, or no, from last year, the tractor, the way they were working, prepping the soil. And it was um, probably a compaction issue, I guess, that didn't, uh, I believe Ag Canada does a seed count. And I think it's 100 seeds per row, but I'm not exactly sure what that works out to per, for pounds. I would imagine it's, you know, that 10, 12 yeah, pound. Should be, and that's the recommended yeah, difference. yeah. So, w like when I saw this effect here, I wasn't sure whether there was something else happening. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I mean, obviously we're not taking these for yield because of this, this compaction. We'll just take uh, sort of agronomic notes on it, but you can see there are differences in, in how well the genotypes are going through that uh, compaction. Uh, yellow mustard uh, puts out a mucilage, and that's why it's actually quite good under very dry conditions. It puts out a mucilage, and that attracts the water in somehow. It's, it's quite a, a different mechanism than canola to, to get going. Uh, w usually what you're trying to do is, uh, sort of whatever, wherever the moisture is, you're trying to go just into that moisture, uh, and you don't want to go too deep. So I would say it would be under an inch and it could be as, as little as a half an inch. Um, I've put, uh, I've put, uh, canola just right into clay, just laid it right on the clay and, uh, it's basically just a quarter inch and, and you can get a stand even, even with that. Yeah, but of course it depends on your soil texture a lot too. Um, with clay, you have to worry about crusting. Uh, you can have uh, crusting issues because it's a small seed and you'll get that if you have a high clay content and if you get that uh, thunderstorm uh, heavy rain, you, you can have problems and it's, like it's very tricky. How do you how do you save it? Uh, at Ag Canada, I, I worked at Ag Canada for for a number of years uh, as a postdoc, and we had one year the whole nursery, we were going to lose it, and and we went out and tried to bust it up. The material hadn't it hadn't emerged yet, and you could just go over it with something to to bust that that crust. Yeah, clay is clay is a, a nasty animal if it's working against you, yeah. So basically the first plot here is the check. It just happens to be the, the check again. So you can see how, you can see how uh, Andante is not uh, handling the late seeding and the conditions as well. I'm not sure whether that's the same in the second trial. I'll pick it up in the second trial for you as well. But so you can see there's improvements coming here. So Andante's looking better here. So it's getting, I was getting, uh, it's getting too bad a rap on the other one. Okay, so, uh, so uh, that's the uh, yellow mustard program. We are, we are uh, moving forward in, in uh, exploiting heterosis and the wind is carrying my voice the other way. So basically I said that Andante is this plot here and it's uh, it's showing uh, much nicer than than the plots that we looked at there so uh, the the one effect was that the uh, discs were probably up for a run there so uh, uh, that's the uh, or this is the uh, sort of pre co-op material of the yellow and now we'll just walk up to uh, I believe it's the uh, oriental uh, pre-co-op material and we'll have a look at that and I'll talk a little bit about some of the uh, systems we're working with there to produce hybrids and more stable yields. Hey Howard, how does the mustard withstand the flower blasting? Is there varietal differences? That is, a, that is a species difference. Species. Um, in terms of how, you mean the mechanism? I am not absolutely... Oh, well. Uh, how well? Very well. Very well. It, it will take uh, quite a few more degrees than canola. Canola will start having difficulty at 30 degrees, especially if it can't get moisture. 
you know, you'll, you'll walk out to your field and you'll see the canola just, the leaves all, they just kind of drop. Uh, mustard will hang in and you won't see that effect on the mustard as quickly. Like you'll, you'll it, and I'm not sure whether you see it here so much with, with the type of soil texture you have, but if the, if the canola plant can't get enough moisture, sort of that midday, that, that heat, it'll just start to wilt. It'll just start to wilt. And if, and if it doesn't get enough moisture at all, it'll start to rattle. And when it starts to rattle, you're in big trouble. But, but that wilting is a natural uh, sort of defense mechan mechanism for the canola. And uh, so whether or not it's a blasting effect or whether or not it's, uh, it starts to lose its attractiveness to insect pollinators or whether the pollen uh, is not as dispersed, I'm not sure the exact mechanism of why uh, yellow mustard is even better than the Junceas, or than the Oriental and the yellow, uh, in terms of the flower blast. And uh, flower blast is, for people who don't know, it's when these actual buds explode. They start to split open and then they dry out. And that's, that's uh, with, with Napus canola, if you start to get that, that's your end, that cuts off your your potential for that stock. And then it's got to come from another branch because it just keeps coming off, off that stock. And so if you look at these, you'll see they're all nice and closed. And we've had temperatures, what's the last few days been? I mean, it's been pretty warm, right? You can see those buds are all nice, nicely closed up. The small ones are all, they're coming along. And uh, that, uh, that's a, a characteristic, especially of the yellows. That uh, we'll we'll have a look at the Oriental when we get over there. But not sure the mechanism, but it's it's a species characteristic. Yeah. And does the Carinata have the same? Oh, Car as yellow? Carinata. Uh, you mean that characteristic? The, the heat, yeah. There's the heat tolerance. Heat tolerance. Carinata. Carinata is um, uh, the center of origin is Ethiopia high mountains and, and all of those areas. And it's extremely drought tolerant and extremely good for uh, blast. Uh, it's got some interesting uh, um, defense mechanisms. And I think they've gotten rid of some of the genes that, that caused it to have problems with uh, drops in temperature. But the initial material, uh, you put it out and it would just segregate when you had a cold night. It would, you just wouldn't even freeze, but it would just, it didn't like it being cold. So I think they've got it, uh, wor that worked out, so. You talk about plant species with abilities to withstand drought tolerance and all these different mechanisms, whether we know them or not. And now we're also hearing a lot of products on the marketplace that have the same sort of claims as far as, you know, you spray it and it's supposed to help with drought tolerance. Do you have any knowledge of the, those types of practices? Is there any? Well, some of those, some of those practices are, or some of those chemical uh, sprays, they would actually uh, coat the, uh, coat the uh, leaves probably. And, and uh, this, the, um, the leaf, the leaf has small holes in it, stomata they called, that open and close when, when it, the plant needs to respire and, and cool itself or uh, uh, go through its process of photosynthesis. And so if you close those up, yes, you may get a temporary benefit that the plant remains uh, uh, turgid or, or uh, uh, upright and things, but then it may get too warm and you may, you may pass that threshold and then you're getting another uh, uh, penalty. Uh, a different stress or a different penalty because I mean there's a reason that the plant is trying to open up and cool itself off or you know use moisture to cool it like there's reasons for it so um, I'm not I'm not exactly sure of some of the other products uh, there may be uh, other hormone products that, that do other things I'm not sure uh, I would say if you could affect the, uh, you know, the root, and uh, there's some products, uh, what was it, I think Brett Young had a product that in, increased root mass uh, with, um, I think it's a microbial. That to me sounds like a um, 
you know, a synergistic type thing that's not going to uh, mess up the, uh, the physiology and lead to other problems. So it sounds like it should be a, a reasonable thing. But uh, I think that whole area of, of microbials and uh, fungicides, those are not fungicides, but, but uh, beneficial fungi, those types of things seem to be, um, you know, they seem to be wins when, when we're using them. And uh, yeah, I mean, there's, there's interactions we don't understand and, and our agricultural systems are very uh, uh, monolithic, you want to call it, and they're barren, in other words. We try, and, we try and get everything the same. And with the microbes, that may not be a good thing. You know, so we may be, and you mentioned it even with the, with the, uh, with the corn and that, the, that effect. And so there, there may be benefits that we can, we can uh, improve on, on, our, on our microflora, I guess you'd call it, yeah. Mike just asked me to, to uh, point out some of the differences between this and canola. So the first thing uh, that, you, that you would notice if we grabbed a canola plant, well, they're right there. If you look over there and you look back here, the blueness, this, this, uh, the juncea doesn't have a waxy layer. And so you don't have you don't have the uh, that that color that blue co the blue color. So and you'll see it if you put it right beside each other. Yeah. So it's 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 got a it's got a more blue. Generally, the the canola is a more blue, more waxy. And uh, then the uh, the more the architecture of the leaves. You can see here the 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 leaf is got a petiole. And here is a clasping. Yeah. And then your color of your uh, your actual color of your flowers is there's a difference on the on the coloration of the flowers too. Now, having looked at a lot of these, <laughs> okay, maybe it's not showing up as as well as you'd see, but you can see there's a different vividness in the color. Yeah. Which, which is darker then? Do yeah. Think, or darker yellow? Is yeah. Yeah, the canola is generally the yellow. Your sunglasses the yellow. on is really yep. tough. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah. I remember one time I was inspecting a, I was inspecting a Polish canola crop, and I was, I was saying, you know, the last time I saw this, there was white flowers in here somewhere. And I was standing right in front of the plant, and I had the, uh, I had the um, whatever, polarizing, polarizing, and forget it, yeah. So it does, it does help to look at, uh, for the coloration to look at it without the sunglasses on, for sure. So, um, yeah, and then of course, the yellow mustard looks like wild mustard, and that's that's a, a typical uh, um, weed that gets in the yellow mustard, and in in order to um, distinguish the yellow, the uh, wild mustard has a purpling anthocyanin that's very intense uh, at the base of the leaves. Now. There are some of that purpling in some uh, varieties uh, of yellow mustard as well, but it's, a, it's in a different pattern on the plant. So sometimes it can be a little bit of a challenge, but most often, bang on, you can tell wild mustard as a weed right away. Yeah. So uh, here we've got plot, I think it's plot number eight here is, is uh, Centennial Brown, which is the Czech variety. What we've got in the species that uh, make up brown mustard and yellow mustard is you have uh, a closer um, relatedness to canola. So the good news for plant breeders is then we can use the same types of tools that we're using in canola to make hybrids in this species. That's the good news. The bad news is as soon as you produce sterols of this, you have to worry about the pollen of that. They will actually, it will actually facilitate pollination. And so if you're trying to produce your uh, experimental hybrid seed and you're saying, oh, I can do it here in my, you know, I could have a plot here. That's too close to this. You would get a percentage of your pollinations coming from, from uh, uh, your canola field and that's gonna mess up your seed production. So it, it adds a, a complication and it actually probably will add uh, isolation distances when we're doing seed production. 
as well because we have to very much be aware of that uh, GMO uh, that's in the uh, napis. We do not want it to be getting anywhere near our hybrid seed productions that we might be doing in this species. So, uh, let's just have a look how, how the, uh, we can walk along here and, and have a look how the varieties are, are doing relative to the, uh, the check here. Uh, Centennial Brown should be plot 14, I think. So this is the first plot here. What you may, like it's, it's difficult with, uh, with the uh, compaction conditions here, but what you may see is uh, maybe a little bit of improved uniformity in, in some of the other lines. Some of these would be uh, inbreds and some of them may be, uh, may be hybrids. <clears throat> but Centennial Brown is, is looking okay, for sure. So with hybrid production, uh, the canola companies invested millions to get where they are and also took many, many years to get where they are. But uh, Bayer, for instance, went around the globe and made face-to-face uh, uh, -face meetings and, and connections and collections of germplasm to build their stocks. And I mean, some of, some of that, uh, uh, well, anyway, they were very aggressive, let's say, let's put it that way, in collecting the germplasm of the world. Um, with, uh, with the mustard species, we do not have uh, as, uh, uh, number one, there's not as many breeding programs in, in the mustard. And so there's, there's germplasm in, in India, there's germplasm in Europe. Those are your kind of uh, germplasm pools. There's, there's some in Asia, but it's a, it's a much, uh, I mean, it's a tremendous effort to bring those uh, products together and to get all of the quality characteristics that you want, because these are condiment crops and you need to get the glucosinolate profile that you need for the condiment. And some of these germplasm pools have different uh, sort of wild uh, glucosinolate profiles, and those need to be um, selected for the Canadian crop requirements. And so uh, when you do that, then you're bringing the germplasm closer together and you're losing that heterosis in the, in the pools. So, uh, what a plant breeder is trying to do is they're, they're trying to cross uh, the two germplasm pools and say, yes, this, this, uh, uh, this combination is heterotic, therefore these two inbreds go into these two pools and you keep them separate. I mean, companies would name them like children. They would never, they would never intermix uh, these pools. And so the skill is to Make, making sure that you're, that you're uh, getting your yield increase, keeping those, those uh, pools separate, and then you have to intercross within those pools and gradually increase the performance of each of your uh, parental children pools, you want to call it. And those, those, uh, that's how you're, that's how you're uh, getting your second generation of, of yield increase. Your first generation is the two pools. The second generation is the ongoing uh, increase that you can get in your, in your uh, uh, performance. Uh, Pioneer, uh, the breeder once confided in me, he said, I actually selected for too high oil content in his, in his pools. And so he was reaching a plateau because he couldn't get his yield potential. So it's, it's a very uh, delicate balance how to build those pools. In some ways, Condiments are easier because we don't have to deal with, with some of the, the quality parameters that are, uh, we're causing problems in, uh, in uh, canola. We don't have to deal with some of the disease problems that, that are in canola. But in other ways, it's, it's uh, a challenge. But it definitely is a challenge when you're only one program and you don't have uh, the resources. So it's a, it's a very big investment to, uh, to move into hybrid breeding. Yes. 
Uh, I think it's the yellow that's on the hot dogs. I, I must say I'm new to the... Yeah. I think this is the, uh, like the gray poupon and things, the other flavor. There's different... Yeah, this one, this one is the brown. Yeah, just a second. This one's the brown. So where does the brown go? Um, I'm sorry, I'm a bit at a loss on, on where the utilization is for the brown. Is that one into more... in Oriental are primarily spices. So they go into meats. You find them on your spice rack, whatever, whatever you're using to cook. But they also... The yellow mustard is the hot dog mustard. Yeah, okay, yeah. But, but they also put it in as fillers and yeah. all types of... Is it, the, is it the brown that goes into fillers because of the seed color? Or brown and oriental. Can they, they they're substitute to a certain intermix. Color. Okay. Okay. Yeah. No, I've uh, I've just started uh, with mustard twenty one last year, so I'm not up to speed on all of the all of the commercial uh, utilizations on them. <clears throat> and price point, I th in the marketplace, each one has a different price. The, they're, the yellow has a different price per pound. Brown has a different price per pound, and oriental. Uh, I believe that brown is second uh, largest market share, and then the oriental. I believe that's still the case. It, it can fluctuate around a bit. So. Is there a hybrid line we can look at in here? Uh, you're probably... Uh, I can't definitively tell from my field book here. Uh, in the co-op, we could look at, at a hybrid line, yeah. Here, there's, there could be a mixture of uh, doubled haploids and hybrids. Sorry. I don't have the detail in my book here. Good, we, good thing we started early so the wind didn't get up. Okay, so we've got basically, uh, um, I think there's two brown trials and then we're going into the oriental trials so we can just move along here So whether you want to You can uh, jump in the in the uh, Wagon and they can drive us around or you can if you're feeling okay. We can walk down. We're right all the way to the tents now. This is uh, One of the diseases that we have in uh, The Juncias that's not in the uh, it's not a problem in canola. And it's called white rust Okay, and uh, there's there are two races, and we uh, are trying to incorporate resistance to both of them. So that is uh, that can be a uh, see it takes out the leaf. Basically, that'll come right through and, and uh, dry out your leaf. Um, Jansia has uh, that as a a problem that has to be bred for. The the other thing that I have seen. Uh, I don't see any of them now, but uh, basically it's it's like a wilt, and it's a pinch on the on the basal stem, and the plant just is just wilting, and it just goes down, and it can affect quite large plants too. I don't know whether uh, whether they've characterized what that disease is. Uh, it uh, I see it every once in a while. I've seen it in the nursery at Agriculture Canada, but. Uh, they don't seem to uh, uh, be classifying it as a problem per se, but I, I didn't see any of it here at all. So that's, uh, that's a good thing as well. Uh, the uh, Juncea species has a good uh, resistance to the black leg. Um, the, uh, uh, the black leg is always changing though, and so there is uh, uh, a possibility that the resistance that's in the black uh, in the juncea could be overcome by the black leg organism. I'm not exactly sure because, for sure, the canola breeders have utilized the gene that's in juncea in the Napus uh, canola programs, and so that's getting exposed then to the to the black leg organism. Okay, so this is which trial was it again? Three. Oh, it's just a short walk, right? So Cutlass is plot 16. So we'll just walk along here and look at Cutlass. Uh, 16 is the one we wanted. Yeah, here, this is Cutlass. This looks like Cutlass. So Cutlass is, Cutlass is a little bit shorter and early. That's uh, one of the features of Cutlass. 
I think one of the things that I've noticed is with the uh, with some of the first generation materials, they're getting a little bit later. I'm not sure in the mustard growing areas how critical that is. I know for you guys it's not an issue here in southern Alberta. Growing degree days, generally not too much of a problem with for, for mustard. Cutlass is, is on the early side, so it's looking normal, so that's, that's great. Some of these are, bi are, are big guys. So, Ken, I can turn it over to you, or any questions. I mean, if anybody's got any more questions, please let me know. So here, here's another line here, it's quite, quite late. Any last questions for Howard? I'll ask a question about Brassica Carinata. So yes. What, what do you think of its future? Uh, it's not going to be a edible oilseed crop in the short term uh, because of glucosinolate problems. Uh, in turn, you mean its future in terms of aircraft oil? Yeah, I think market market opportunities and you know the agronomics in terms of growing it and yield. And the then problem, I think. Now this is a personal opinion. I don't I don't know, uh, but in general, with Trump being not embracing the global warming. I would say that probably is dampening things a little bit because, I mean, it was really taken off in the U.S. and uh, uh, what was it, Perlator fleet, and there was all kinds of things that were that were uh, on the on the on a checklist. If those stay in place, it's good. Um, what are the economics of growing jet fuel? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, we we got slammed for uh, Alberta tar sand oil, you know. So are they going to start putting that test on growing fuel? You know, ethanol in the States, I mean, they have to, they have to look inward to some of those uh, economics as well. Um, short carbon cycles, I mean, it all, it all seems to work in the green uh, agenda to say, okay, we're going to grow this, we're going to chop it up and we're going to burn it, and then we're going to grow it again. And there's net, you know what I mean, it's a net... Uh, effect. But all of those calculations have to be done and you have to present them to the right people and make your make your case and your arguments. But I mean, yeah, uh, I think it I think it has potential as a species. It's a very uh, tough uh, species and uh, the uh, probably we need more herbicide tools with it. That would help. But uh, yeah, from a point of view of uh, heat, it's probably one of the better ones we've got. Yeah, for sure. Join me in thanking Howard. We're just going to head back to the tent here for a little.